Welcome everybody. We're just going to give it a little uh, time while the waiting room queues up here. So, and folks start continue to join. We'll get started very shortly. Well, I think we're ready uh, to get started. Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Jody Alwyn, and I'm the Director of Education, Medical Education Director for Respicardia. We are very excited to have you all with us here today to learn from Dr. Imani and Dr. Fudim on cardiology perspective on treating central sleep apnea. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to go over a few Zoom logist logistics. Um, I'm sure by now, most of you, if not all, are familiar with Zoom. Um, but please use the Q&A button that is usually found at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to ask a question. There is a significant number of you guys on this uh, call, so um, we will address your questions as best as we can. Um, we will take the questions at the end or after each um, uh, speaker presents um, as to make sure that we get the adequate discussion uh, or the uh, make it through the presentations. Um, unfortunately, the raise your hand feature is not active for this webinar. Um, so you will need to type your question. I will now uh, like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Uh, Sadora Mesh Imani is Associate Professor of Medicine at Ohio State University and is dual trained in both advanced heart failure, cardiac transplant, as well as interventional cardiology, and also serves as the Director of Heart Failure Clinical Research. Dr. Marat Pudim is Assistant Professor of Medicine and is Heart Failure Cardiologist at Duke University. He completed his clinical and research fellowship training at Vanderbilt, Duke University, and Duke Clinical Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Imani, I will uh, pass it off to you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, very much for some time this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, maybe shed just a little bit of light on how I approach sleep apnea, the current treatments, uh, and in specific, central sleep apnea. I'm still waiting for the controls to come over to me. There we go. They should be, it says, you should be able to just click on your screen, Dr. Imani. Yep, we're good now. Okay. So I think from a starting point, uh, you know, this is sort of my version of a disclaimer. Uh, I think there are a couple of things from a cardiology perspective that we would need to understand or lay down as foundations. And the first is to really believe that sleep disorder breathing is a problem and that it exists in our cardiology population. In fact, I would venture and propose to most of us that sleep disorder breathing is becoming more of a cardiovascular problem than it is anything else because of the high rate of concurrent cardiovascular disease. And I think both Dr. Padim and I will talk a little bit about that overlap. But these patients are in our clinic. This is not something that we need to be out searching for. It's right under our noses. And if we start with that belief, I think we can really move forward in trying to identify and then deliver appropriate therapies for these patients. Within sleep disordered breathing, there's a lot of terminology that maybe is foreign from a cardiology perspective or coming to us new. And central sleep apnea, I think, is now starting to really establish itself as a unique diagnosis. So point number two is not only do we have to believe that these patients exist in our clinics, and on our services, but also 
that they can have more than one form. All sleep apnea is not obstructive sleep apnea. All sleep apnea is not treated by mask-based therapy. And that leads to point number three, the treatment of central sleep apnea, because it is a distinct physiologic process, is distinct from other forms of sleep disorder breathing therapies. Again, obstructive sleep apnea, narcotic induced, there is a whole gamut, a spectrum of them, but when we focus on central, it's something unique. My other disclaimer is that central sleep apnea overlays all forms of cardiovascular disease, but I am originally and still true to heart, a heart failure doc. So I'm gonna talk about this a lot from the heart failure perspective, but you can probably substitute in atrial fibrillation, chronic difficult to control hypertension, uh, for those that work with cerebrovascular disease or stroke risk, this all ties in together. So wherever I'm saying heart failure with the exception of some specific data points, you can substitute whichever your flavor of cardiology you enjoy the most. Definitions I think help. Central sleep apnea by definition is the disruption of nocturnal breathing but disruption because of a change in the neural drive, the mechanism, the electromechanical mechanism that causes us to breathe and requires us to breathe at night gets disrupted. And that is a central point, pun intended, because our treatment has to focus on the actual problem and not other areas of anatomy or physiology that could be affected in related forms of sleep apnea. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Who are these patients? Again, high concurrent rate with heart failure or atrial fibrillation, um, high concurrent rate with those that have cerebrovascular disease, 10 to 15% overlap there, um, patients that are older, patients um, that are on multiple medications, uh, stuff that's very typical, I think, for what walks in our doors. There is a subset of patients that we are now labeling as idiopathic central sleep apnea. Uh, there may be stuff that we don't know about these patients yet. Uh, unknown, of course, if they have a higher uh, risk of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease when their central sleep apnea is a presenting uh, problem. But you know, keep that in mind and tucked away because we can certainly try to help those patients that are currently being labeled as idiopathic. Not only is it a concurrent uh, problem, it's not a marker of disease, but it's a therapeutic target. Central sleep apnea is a place where we can generate worsening cardiovascular outcomes when it exists, and particularly when it exists in an untreated form. So you see here the data that suggests 50% more likely to have a heart failure readmission. We know that that's a terrible thing, metrics that all of us are held accountable to. The mortality rate can go up. Uh, increased incidence of the other related comorbid conditions, atrial fibrillation. But really, if we're trying to help our patients, we want to focus on the outcome, or sorry, the effects that patients notice: fatigue, quality of life, functional status being diminished. All these things happen with central sleep apnea, as they do with other forms of sleep apnea. And so, if we really want to try to help our patients, and particularly those patients that are coming in for their follow-up visits stating they're just not feeling well, not doing as well, and you know, we've got them on all the right medical therapies, we've taken them through all the right diagnostic and therapeutic testing, what are we missing? It may be their sleep apnea burden. Really basic pathophysiology to help us understand how treatment fits in. We know that carbon dioxide regulation is regulated from the brain in normal sleep patterns. The brain detects disruptions or changes or even natural physiologic variations to our carbon dioxide levels and then goes back to signal our respiratory cycle through the phrenic nerve. This becomes our therapeutic zone of um, effective therapy because that is the area that can be disrupted or is abnormal in central sleep apnea. In central sleep apnea, uh, the Changes to arterial levels of CO2 might be sensed, but then you just don't create the neurological drive to trigger your diaphragm to create a natural breath. Uh, and I'm going to compare this to obstructive sleep apnea, 
where the disruption isn't in the want to breathe or the body's attempt to breathe, but rather is more of an obstruction, hence the name, from an anatomic reason in generating an appropriate breath. This is a basic representative snippet of some polysomnography sleep testing that tries to illustrate that point. And on the left of the screen, you see our kind of standard obstructive sleep apnea, the form of sleep apnea that I think most of us are more familiar with, and certainly the general public tends to be more familiar with. And if you look at the tracings and the abdominal effort and the, thora the thoracic effort uh, in the left where the arrows point out, you can see that during a period of apnea, you are trying to generate that negative pressure within the thoracic cage to draw flow, but you don't have nasal flow because of typically an oropharyngeal obstruction, the soft palate falling backwards, the tongue, uh, whatever it may be, you just don't have that flow in. Now, there's a phase delay, but oxygenation drops because you don't have good airflow and air exchange then eventually you do generate a breath and it resets itself. Compare that to the right side of the screen in a fairly uh, representative central sleep apnea tracing. And you can see that during that period of apnea, there is no drive. There's no contraction of your diaphragm. There's no expansion of your thoracic muscle cage. You're not generating that negative pressure. And that's why you don't have nasal flow. Same phase delay, drop in oxygenation, uh, and then eventual reset of the system and a breath. For those that are interested in the diagnostic aspects of it, this is why it would be important when you send your patients for sleep testing to make sure that they are being tested in a way that actually can measure that thoracoabdominal movement. Because if you're just doing nocturnal saturation evaluations, you can see those two waveforms can look very similar, or if somehow you're doing nasal flow measurements, those both drop equally in both forms. It's a differentiation in the muscle contractions and the attempt to move the thoracoabdominal cavity that is the main thing that we want to be able to use to differentiate between obstructive and central sleep apnea. Other metrics and um, terminology is, oh, we went one too far. Let's see. If, thank you. Uh, other metrics and terminology that often comes up as we start to speak the language of sleep doctors and speak the language of efficacy. Uh, the apnea hypopnea index is the you know, overall number of total apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep, and you can see uh, severity grading there. We tend to focus on patients that are moderate or severe, so greater than or equal to 15 AHI events per hour. Uh, the central apnea index follows as the number of those apnea uh, or AHI events that generates from a central cause. Um, you'll see these other terms pop up, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the trial results that are metrics and measures of sleep quality, the number of times the patient desaturates, uh, the arousal index, uh, REM sleep, I think we're all fairly familiar with, you know, as a marker of quality of sleep. Uh, again, to hammer home this point, uh, it is important to realize that the concurrent cardiovascular conditions are high in a population of patients who have been diagnosed with central sleep apnea. So again, we don't want to waste our time trying to find a therapy for patients that we are out searching for. You know, these are the patients that if you start to understand that they where they are and look more closely at them, we'll try to uh, we'll be better at identifying those patients that have CSA. And you can see again the statistics. Uh, again, high concurrent rate. You know, why is it important? To, I touched on this a little bit, but in, by way of some additional illustration, uh, central sleep apnea puts us in this dilatorious cycle where sympathetic tone goes up, um, that increases the apnea and hypopnea that one experiences, and you get more arousals, poor sleep quality. Uh, the lack of quality sleep, the increased sympathetic tone, all drives more ischemia and inflammation at the cellular and tissue levels. These are all the things that clinically manifest themselves in the symptoms we know, fatigue, hypersomnolence, 
Um, it's always kind of interesting to talk to patients about maybe some of their forgetfulness and inability to concentrate being related to sleep quality um, and it's also mood and depression. You see again, twice as likely to have heart failure issues. In my world, this is critically important. We're trying to keep patients out of the hospital. We're trying to keep them doing well, and we're certainly trying to keep them alive. And here we've got a risk factor that is quite significant in the wrong direction. Focusing a little bit on the right side of the screen, this is a similar concept just laid out again for everybody. Uh, and that is, and focusing a little bit on the effects of sympathetic activation, increased renin levels, heart rate, peripheral vascular resistance, you know, all the things that I am trying so hard to fight against using my beta blockers and ACE and ARBs and now ARNIs and uh, aldosterone antagonism, it, I can undo it all in a poor night's worth of sleep if the patient's natural physiologic processes are just driving sympathetic tone. Uh, from an interventional standpoint, my interventional hat. Uh, MIs go up, uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease incidents can go up due to the inflammation and ischemia as well. So how do we treat this? And again, we'll use it as a little bit of comparison to start uh, the obstructive sleep apnea story. You know, obstructive sleep apnea, there have been a fair number of therapies tried and a fair number of therapies that show benefit depending on patient selection positive airway pressure, your mask-based therapies, I think are the mainstay, CPAP and BiPAP, um, very good at treating it if the patient can tolerate wearing it. Again, you're overcoming the anatomic problems by forcing air through the obstructive component of the oropharynx. Hence the oral appliance that can also help open up that airway. Uh, the use of pharmacologic therapies to drive better sleep or different sleep, but stimulants essentially. Uh, surgical correction of anatomic deformities, uh, and even hypoglossal nerve stimulation that can help move the posterior or pharynx out of the way uh, with respiratory cycle at night. So all of these therapies have shown efficacy. They all now have labeling to treat obstructive sleep apnea, but when you try to move that over to central sleep apnea, it doesn't translate as well. Mask-based therapies don't seem to work, and it makes sense. I'm not overcoming an anatomic barrier, um, and I'll star then ASV, or adaptive servoventilation, which is a unique algorithm of a mask-based therapy that can help because of its way of delivering the positive pressure in a subset of patients with central sleep apnea and those with more of a preserved ejection phenotype. Uh, oxygen therapy doesn't help. Again, I'm not trying to force just more oxygen. It's not being transported down to the bronchial tree into the lungs. Pharmacologic therapy hasn't seemed to work. And it leaves us with phrenic nerve stimulation. And phrenic nerve stimulation has shown in clinical trials to be efficacious in improving central sleep apnea sleep patterns and improving clinical outcomes related to central sleep apnea. Uh, busy slide, uh, not going to bore you with all the details here, just to kind of show that there is a variety of trials and published literature out there looking at the attempts to treat central sleep apnea. And in particular here, we selected out a subpopulation of reduced EF heart failure patients that have concurrent central sleep apnea and attempts to treat. You can see uh, adaptive servoventilation or ASV has been tried uh, in a variety of settings. CPAP therapy, the more common, also tried. And then down here at the bottom is phrenic nerve stimulation. Uh, the important points of this chart are some of the study durations and follow-ups that uh, have been seen in here in trans, uh, phrenic nerve stimulation, transvenous phrenic nerve stimulation. You see outcomes out to 36 months. And Dr. Fadima, I think, is gonna go through these trial data in a little bit more detail. A lot of the other trials have looked at very short-term measures to see if things have improved or not, with the exception of this trial, which is the uh, serve hf trial, which did follow patients out to 31 months. So serve hf is a really important trial to talk about, looking at ASV in reduced EF patients with central sleep apnea. Um, a lot of it was based on early work out of a study called the CANPAP, or the Canadian PAP study, uh, 
uh, in the CANPAP study, CPAP specifically didn't show uh, benefit from a primary endpoint. So the, the trial did not meet primary endpoint. Uh, however, a post hoc analysis looking at a subgroup of patients, uh, and particularly those with the reduced DF and, and moderate to severe central sleep apnea defined by an AHI of greater than 15, may have had some benefit from mask-based therapies. Extrapolating from data looking at ASV and its algorithm versus just straight continuous pressure, the SERVE-HF trial was designed and executed trying to look at ASV in the same population, and the primary endpoint was combined uh, you know, cardiovascular events and um, mort including mortality and you know, the type of trial that I think we're used to seeing. Uh, 1,300 plus patients enrolled, so a really good um, enrollment, uh, multinational, and no difference in primary endpoints. So not only did ASV fail to show improvement in the metrics that we set out to look at, uh, but actually there was a marker towards increased mortality, both all-cause and cardiac mortality, in patients who were being actively treated with ASV. This was both unexpected and alarming uh, in this population. It led to a lot of um, discussion uh, in the literature and at meetings, you know, what is it, why is it happening? Uh, but ultimately, this is the reason that the FDA issued a black box warning, and that is patients who have symptomatic heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction should not have their central sleep apnea treated with ASV. Oxygen therapy uh, for central sleep apnea, I think it's uh, a story still being written. It's worth mentioning that there's an ongoing trial looking at oxygen therapy to try to help, particularly for patients who don't like mask-based therapies, uh, and it might serve as an interesting alternative to patients that may not want a device, although many of our patients are used to receiving devices. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen, and that's why we're doing the study, but as of right now, there's nothing that can truly be said about oxygen therapy from a definitive standpoint. Leaves us with transvenous phrenic nerve stimulation or the remedy system to help treat central sleep apnea. Again, I think Dr. Padim will go in with a little bit more detail on the how the therapy is delivered through this device, uh, but you can see here um, some basic concepts and components of the system itself. In our cardiology world, this should look very familiar. An implantable device with leads, this doesn't scare us. We know how to counsel our patients about getting this type of device. We know that implantable devices help and really do change outcomes as we go along. So central sleep apnea, you know, again, looking at the gamut of therapies that have been tested and evaluated previously, if we look at AHI, a measure of sleep quality, remember the apnea hypopnea index, you want that to go down. And just purely looking at this as a metric, we see that actually all therapies tend to have some trend towards improvement, if not statistically proven benefits in reduction in AHI. So improving the sleep architecture, at least at a cursory level, can occur with both MAPS-based therapies, CPAP, ASV, and also with phrenic nerve stimulation. But when we start to look at other outcomes that are equally, if not uh, more important to our patients, quality of life, for example, I can make a number look better on a recurrent sleep test, but does the patient actually feel better? Are they actually out doing more in his or her life? You know, and when we check quality of life metrics, we see that there's an unequal different or an unequal effect based on the therapies. Um, you know, now all trials, and we'll have to admit, weren't designed to look specifically at quality of life. So there's some extrapolation or some underpowered issue, underpowering issues here. But again, take it for what it's worth, at least when we look at the data that is available, uh, we see some variable changes. Uh, phrenic nerve stimulation having an improvement in the consistent improvement of quality of life. Uh, over a period of time with therapy.
cardiovascular outcomes, uh, you can see here trials designed all a little bit differently, looking at different combinations uh, in that middle column, uh, but important uh, outcomes such as hospitalization, mortality, and you see again a variable effect based on the therapy selected. Um, the hazard ratios shown, and we talked about the ASB story actually having an increased trend towards mortality based on the SERVE-HF trial versus trends that actually favor lower mortality with chronic nerve stimulation. And uh, again, we'll asterisk that and say, you know, we aren't, we haven't specifically studied uh, chronic nerve stimulation as a mortality trial, so we are extrapolating data. But again, take it for what it's worth uh, and understand that this might be something that's important to you and your patient when talking and counseling them about the different therapeutic options available. So I think the conclusion here, just from the beginning part, again, sleep disordered breathing, it's very prevalent in our cardiovascular population. Uh, again, in my world, my heart failure patients, I, I tell them, if you're coming to see me in a heart failure clinic uh, and you're a poker player, you're gonna understand that I'm playing with the stacked deck. You probably have it just by virtue of coming to see me. Central sleep apnea is distinct and a unique form of sleep disordered breathing. Um, and it has a negative impact on cardiovascular outcomes and the quality of life of cardiovascular patients. We don't have a huge gamut of therapeutic options, approved, proven therapies, um, and the therapies that are used for other forms of sleep apnea may not be applicable because of the unique physiologic aspects and pathophysiologic aspects of central sleep apnea, uh, where chronic nerve stimulation has shown some consistent uh, and uh, benefits uh, depending on which ones you look at comparatively. So I think with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Pradeem. Awesome, thank you. That was awesome, Mr. Dr. Amani. I, uh, I actually learned a lot. Um, if you pull up my slides, I will I'll give myself the liberty to use one or two slides maybe to summarize what was just said, but I'm not sure that much is needed. Also, I'm very jealous of your background. I heard the, uh, the birds uh, chirping in the background. All you hear in my background <laughs> is Duke air conditioning. It's still pretty hot outside. Uh, all right, so I move ahead. Uh, notably, let's see if it moves on. Uh, I'm a consultant to Respicardia, so I need to disclose that. And here we go. So, you know, in a few sentences to summarize, central sleep apnea is very prevalent, particularly prevalent amongst patients with heart failure. It's true for systolic and diastolic heart failure. And presence of uh, central sleep apnea leads to a, a number of detrimental physiological effects, including an increased sympathetic tone that leads to uh, apneas, more apneas leads to more ischemia and hypoxia leads to more sympathetic hyperactivation. And, and the result of all of that is that patients with heart failure are at increased risk of uh, bad clinical outcomes, such as increased heart failure hospitalizations or increased comorbid disease, which is associated with sympathetic overdrive, such as atrial fibrillation. And despite the paucity of the therapeutic options in central sleep apnea since over the five, for the last few years since uh, frank nerve stimulation was FDA approved, which is now a couple of years back, uh, we now have the opportunity to treat central sleep apnea using a transvenous approach. Um, and this approach is interesting because it actually not, has, not only has uh, some of the most robust data, but it's also one of the few therapies that has uh, several trials that are prospective. And here is a summary of clinical studies that have been done for this uh, device system. And as you see, initially the company started uh, performing safety studies for the device, for the leads, and um, following initial feasibility analysis, the, the, what, the studies that I'm drawing your attention to are the two last ones, the pilot study and the pivotal study, 49 and 151 patients. And this is relevant because those two studies were intentionally designed to be uh, pooled at some point in the, uh, in the near future, which is what I went ahead and did. Uh, 
Um, the two studies have a comparable design with some key differences, have very similar inclusion and exclusion criteria, and uh, use the same time points of follow-up and thus inherently allow a patient level meta-analysis. And the two studies are shown here. The, on the left side was the uh, pilot study, which was um, published by Bill Abraham as the first author in Jack Heart Failure. And shortly after the pivotal study, which was a randomized study, the pilot study on the left was a single arm study. So everybody got a treatment there. And on the right side, half of the patients had the device turned on right in the beginning and the other half didn't have it turned on and then switched to therapy. And I'll show you a little, little bit more about that. All right, instead of going through each individual trial, I will actually present you the results of both trials combined sort of to, um, to you know, summarize it more quickly. Having said that, I will use the pivotal, the large of the two studies to show you a little bit more about the inclusion and exclusion criteria and the design so you can follow why we did what we did. So the pivotal study, the larger one, was a prospective multicenter randomized controlled study where in order to be included, and it's true for both studies, you had to have an AHI of at least 20. You had to have a central apnea index of at least 50% of all apneas, meaning that central apneas had to be the predominant form of apnea, whereas the obstructive apnea had to be the minority of the events. Important exclusion criteria were that patients that had central sleep apnea driven primarily by medications such as narcotics were excluded, which makes sense. Patients were allowed to have lung disease, yet when lung disease was advanced, defined here by an FPV1 or FVC of less than 65%, patients were excluded. Further, patients with advanced kidney disease were excluded as well as liver disease and hemoglobin. To the endpoints, for, um, for both studies, uh, the endpoint, in the primary endpoint was a reduction in uh, AHI events of at least 50% from baseline for that individual patient. And the safety endpoint was, of course, freedom of any serious adverse events. Se secondary endpoints was the uh, culmination of a lot of the um, clinical endpoints that we use for sleep studies, Dr. Amani mentioned earlier, such as CAI, the arousal index, rapid eye movement sleep, uh, and a couple other points that I'll be mentioning and discussing throughout the presentation. Okay, so here's the makeup of the pivotal study. So randomized 50-50 where patients had all initially a device implanted, but only 50% of the study patients, the therapy was turned on for the first 12 months. And in the other patients, it was initially turned off and then it was turned on. The study was extended up to 18 months in the population in both studies. Okay, so here is the, uh, the publication came out just about six months ago now. So the pooled analysis in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine it was a great team, it was, a, it was a lot of fun to collaborate with a very diverse group of authors. And um, in totals, this is how the pooling scheme looked. So again, patient level data where we had a total of 208 patients. In yellow are the data points that we, are, that we pooled. The pilot data, the single arm study, the first 12 months worth of patient data were pooled. So essentially everybody enrolled into the pilot study. All patients that had initially the therapy on in the treatment arm for the first 12 months were pooled as well. These six months were disregarded. And then patients that had it initially turned off, we disregarded the first six months worth of data and then we used the subsequent 12 months of data. And together, it essentially gave everybody 12 months data of follow-up following the baseline assessment on the sleep study. All right, let's get to the data. So baseline characteristics, probably no surprise there. The average age was 66. Think of your heart failure, not even advanced. So just think of your average heart failure patient, 66 years old. This study was predominantly male, obviously more so than we would probably see in clinical practice. Um, Patients had, in 30% of cases, uh, prior sleep disorder breathing therapy, such as CPAP. Hypertension was the most common comorbidity, closely followed by heart failure. So 70% of the population had heart failure. And uh, here's the breakdown of the NYHA classes. You know, predominantly was two and three. 
CAD was quite present, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, renal disease, all 20 to 40 percent. As you can tell, it's quite comorbid population. Um, the body mass index around 30. So to the vital signs uh, and other relevant parameters at baseline, uh, you know, patients had a blood pressure of around 123. Uh, the ejection fraction in the entire population as read by Core Lab was around 40%. The AHI index, I would like to draw your attention to this, was 44.6. And remember, uh, Dr. Mani showed you that greater than 30 is considered severe. So, you know, in average, the entire population nearly, if you look at the spread here, uh, was uh, predominantly se had severe sleep apnea uh, as defined by the AHI index. The predominant component as intended was the central apnea. All righty. So um, to the safety results, obviously most importantly, the primary uh, and safety endpoint was uh, the um, freedom of serious adverse events. There were no serious adverse events reported. A total of 20 events were present in the pilot, and I, I split it up for one specific reason. As you can imagine, pilot trial preceded the pivotal trial. In 57 patients, there were 20 events, which were a majority um, attributable to lead-related uh, issues, lead dislodgement or lead displacement, which was uh, one of the venous leads that um, is either there for the, uh, is, is there for the sensing of the respiration uh, in most cases, was uh, getting dislodged. And as you note, in the pivotal trial, which was done uh, in many cases in the same centers, but several new centers were added in the pivotal trial. Also, more patients were enrolled. The providers were more experienced now, and there were also some adjustments made to the implantation techniques. And as you can tell, the total number of events dropped now to 13, and many fewer cases of lead dislodgement were present, and many events while reported were probably not directly attributable to the therapy. So all of that was a very encouraging uh, safety profile. And then to the main clinical efficacy results, um, as you can tell, I'm gonna break this down for you. In black is the total AHI. The total AHI, which was close to 50, dropped by about half at the six months mark and maintained following therapy at the 12 months mark unchanged. And it is important because if you look which component was driving this down and the component drove it down was the central apnea index. So the central apnea events is nearly vanished, you know, here from 23, 22, all the way down close to zero was around one. So it shows you that the Frank neurotherapy as intended uh, improved the central sleep apnea events and did not affect this obstructive components or the mixed components uh, that were present as, uh, to a minority. And um, if you look at the other components, such as the arousal index, which is measuring the times that a patient has evidence of arousal on the EEG, for example, and those events were equally decreased as uh, they were decreasing the central apnea events. Similarly, for the ODI4, which indicates the desaturation by at least 4% uh, on these uh, pulse ox, showed that desaturation events equally were decreased uh, during uh, the follow-up of the procedure. Here's the same data now presented with actual values, <clears throat> but I point you towards the red box in the bottom here. So a couple additional parameters that were not in that figure but might be of relevance is, as you can imagine, time spent in hypoxia is not a very good time. So in average, patients spend 28 minutes of their uh, nighttime uh, in, in, hypoxic, in an hypoxic state, this halved at the six and 12 months time, time frame, so essentially halved and then maintained itself through 12 months following therapy compared to baseline. And um, if you look at the upper sleepiness scale that was also mentioned earlier, so the self-reported sleepiness scale also improved significantly as early as six months from nine to six and stayed stable at six. All right, one more table, I promise. We'll go to pictures afterwards. So the this is interesting because we had obviously um, uh, the ability to look at, um, at ejection fraction through follow-up. You know, I, I will start with the bad news. 
brain nerve stimulation does not make you lose weight. You know, that was something I would have hoped for, but it didn't. I, you know, semi-joking, I wouldn't have expected that necessarily, but 29 stayed stable throughout follow-up. So can use that as weight loss therapy. Having said that, if you look at heart failure, here we looked at patients with heart in the heart failure subgroup of EF of less than 45 that had echoes done, there was a reduction of, there was an improvement in injection fraction from baseline to 12 months, which was not seen at the six months mark quite yet. Similarly, if you look at the, uh, the systolic volume, a similar trend at six months, there was a reduction in volume, but at 12 months, it actually met statistical significance from 140 to 105. And uh, six minute walk test did not improve, but the Minnesota, Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire, uh, a multi questionnaire score, did actually improve at the six and 12 mark, which is actually very nice. All right, let's see. So the patient global assessment is another way to assess the global well being of the patient. He also statistically significant improvement at six and 12 months compared to baseline. These are changes compared to baseline. NYHA scale did also improve at six and 12 months. Again, uh, very reassuring, taken together with the LVEF improvement and the uh, LV uh, dimension improvement. Here's a graphical representation of the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire, showing a nearly 40% uh, improvement at follow-up. And then the reviewers asked us to um, to present the data on mortality. And here the all-cause survival, you know, we initially did not intend to present that because there was just, you know, safety endpoint. But it is worth to point out that at 12 months amongst 208 relatively advanced heart failure patients, there was only a 4% mortality. It's so 96% survival at 12 months, which is actually pretty darn good. And as you can tell, between pile and pivotal trial, there wasn't much of a difference. Wouldn't you draw too many conclusions, but maybe a nice thing to see because we didn't have a control group. So in conclusions, central sleep apnea contributes to a harmful, harmful progressive cycle of hypoxia. We have seen and heard about it now. And phrenic nerve stimulation offers a new therapeutic option for the treatment of central sleep apnea. And what I presented to you is to date the largest combined evidence for transvenous phrenic nerve stimulation for central sleep apnea, as it showed you that there was a reduction in the severity of sleep apnea with an improvement in the arousal index, self-reported daytime sleep and this REM sleep, and you know, many objective and subjective parameters that are valuable to our patients. Thus, I think that this neuromodulation approach is um, not only novel, but also an effective treatment for central sleep apnea, which most importantly is probably independent of patient adherence, which is a really nice thing to have. So I thank you very much for your attention and we are open for questions. All right, um, questions. We're um, looking at. So it's maybe this is Robin Germany. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Respicardia. Thank you both for for really outstanding presentations tonight. Um, it's uh, it's great to hear the work that that you've done and and how you've incorporated things into your uh, into your own practice. Um, Jody, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Um, but Absolutely. Wanna, and feel wanna, free to type in questions as well using the Q&A feature at the bottom if, um, to type in some questions. I know there's been a few that Robin has received, so keep sending questions. Thank you. Um, so, so Ramesh, tell me a little bit, um, how, does, how does your practice, how did you guys get started with um, identifying patients? Who, who does that? Is it the... Is it you, as you're talking to patients, do you have um, your staff pre-ask questions? What, what does that look like for your center? Is he on? Yep, I think he's still muted. There we go. Oh, there's a yeah, little delay. <laughs> that's all right, thanks for that question. Yeah, you know, we um, are, are kind of fortunate uh, We've got an advanced heart failure um, clinic and a you know patient intake um, process. And, and what we have again, if we start with the idea that we think that this is a problem, 
we, we incorporated this into our standard heart failure evaluation. So patients who come in uh, either on their new patient visit or even a follow-up and you're classing their NYHA class like you would normally do, uh, and they have persistent, you know, class two, class three, class four symptoms, uh, and in particular, those that on follow-up where we have done all of the things we need to do from a medical therapy standpoint, we've got them on the beta blockers and the RNAs and, you know, maybe now the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, and, and this isn't this is a pure volume issue. They're not coming in wet. Uh, so I think when you do your standard intake questionnaire, you, we're all going to do this. How are you doing today? How, you know, how's your activity level, energy level? And, and if I'm doing my best job and yet there's still class three, especially heart failure, that starts to trigger the, in the back of my mind, what else do I need to do? Um, and that's when I start to talk to them about sleep. And then we've got a nice pathway set up with our sleep colleagues that uh, knowing that these are high risk patients for sleep apnea, we send a referral to our sleep colleagues, depending and you know, how it works and patient logistics, oftentimes we can pre-screen the patients using um, some sleep metric questions or send for a quick basic virtual-esque consult and have the patients go directly for a sleep study, get the sleep study results, and then go see the sleep medicine team for interpretation of results. Um, the key in that collaboration from the sleep standpoint is, again, understanding that if they recognize the CSA pattern, that feedback loop comes back to us and our EP team is, implants the device, we actually get them involved at that point. Um, but in the upfront standpoint, that's us on the physicians, the uh, APPs that are involved with our clinic, you know, anybody who's seeing that patient, even the MAs and nurses that often help room the patients, you can use a standard questionnaire. And you don't have to get really bogged down with all of the um, stop bangs and different sleep scores. It really comes down to is the patient still having symptoms despite me doing a pretty good job managing them, then it's really time to think about adjunctive issues and sleep is one of those important adjunctive issues. So, thanks so much. Um, and then a question from Rod and, and then we have a question that, that I may have to answer, but we'll see here. Um, so, Marat, a question that we've gotten fairly commonly is, is where, where does sleep apnea identification come with all, A, with all the comorbidities and in the, in the treatment, treatment algorithm? Um, so, for example, a question I got early, early today was on CRT. Um, you would still recommend doing CRT prior to... Um, implantation of the remedy system, correct? So uh, let's talk about identification first. I think um, patients often do not tell us uh, or do not volunteer information on sleep apnea. Until you ask, you probably won't know. So I definitely implement um, specific questions to my patients in order to try to identify them. But in all reality, if patients report any form of fatigue or shortness to breath, uh, whether it's out of proportion or not to the heart failure, I do ask them about sleep apnea. And I'm very quick to screen my patients for sleep apnea with an official study, sleep study all night. Um, I think, um, you know, for the presented reasons, you know, treating either central or obstructive sleep apnea has not only improvements on quality and life, but, you know, there's also evidence that you actually can improve objective uh, parameters for the patient. Um, so that, of course, requires a good collaboration with uh, the sleep medicine docs to be able to have that quick referral and then the feedback loop. As to um, um, parallel treatments with other therapies, I never consider treating sleep apnea as, um, as an alternative second line intervention for my patients. It's always a parallel assessment on the first time I see them. And um, uh, that's the reason for that is that I wouldn't want to delay any potential symptomatic or objective improvement on my patients. So if patients need to be evaluated for CRT, CRTD, I do that in parallel and clearly would want to communicate with my uh, electrical colleagues to make sure that any potential implantation would be coordinated. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, a, a couple, a couple of questions here on um, what what therapeutic options you've used with your patients, um, and I know you have some different experiences uh, hands on with this. One is, uh, do you require your patients to fail CPAP before they go on to other therapies such as hypoglossal nerve stimulation? Ramesh, I think. Uh, yeah, I can actually jump in there a little bit. And, I, you know, I think the answer to that, unfortunately, isn't uh, universal for all patient populations. Now, remember, if we're thinking about hypoglossal nerve stimulation, uh, I'm treating an oropharyngeal issue, and that's probably a, an obstructive. So, and then I will lean heavily on my sleep colleagues to make sure that the interpretation of any sleep study was done correctly. Uh, but really pinning down, you know, both the AHI and the CAI. Um, but to say, you know, do you have to fail CPAP? Let's say it turns out to be a predominantly central process. Um, am I going to put the patient through three months of attempting to wear CPAP? The answer is no. Uh, again, I don't think that I'm treating the process correctly. Um, so if it's a true on um, either re-review of a sleep study or on a de novo sleep study, a true central process, uh, I try to have a very frank discussion with the patient uh, on what is happening, and I would go straight for phrenic nerve stimulation. That's great. And then a follow-up question to that is, do you have patients um, on combination therapy um, such as CPAP along with phrenic nerve stimulation? Uh, I'll give my short version. I'll see if Dr. Fadim uh, wants to add uh, his experience. But in our experience here at Ohio State, we do have and have seen a couple of patients on combo therapy, um, both from the uh, pilot and pivotal trials. Uh, in the graph that Dr. Fadim showed, you saw that the sleep apnea or the AHI reduced but didn't go to zero. Uh, and the truth of the matter is people will have mixed phenotype sleep patterns. So if we treat the central component with phrenic nerve stimulation, we may unmask the true component of a residual obstructive process. And then those patients that have a residually high uh, AHI at this point, predominantly obstructive, combining therapies can be done. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Fadim, and like I said, we've had a couple. What's your experience been with that? Well, I mean, this is, I think, the point exactly is that uh, if you look back at the data, you remember that I pointed out that 30% of patients had either historic or current treatment for sleep apnea. And, you know, uh, going into the uh, clinical studies with uh, frank nerve simulation. So, I mean, there were concomitant treatment of sleep apnea with uh, obstructive sleep apnea with masks. So, I mean, yes, absolutely. That, that is not uncommon. And I don't think there's any contraindication to do that. No, that's really correct. Different diseases. Now, I would point out in the in the trials, there was no other therapy that was used through the first twelve months, but but that is correct that um, the that that there is no contraindication for that. Obviously, it had to stand on its own merit uh, during the clinical trial. Um, uh, this is kind of an interesting one, and I and I don't know how much in today's world you guys have have been talking to your sleep labs. We had a we've had some discussions with a number of, of sleep clinics, but what is your opinion? You know, um, just by their very nature, these heart failure patients are high risk for for COVID nineteen. Um, there has been some debate over continuing to bring these patients in for overnight studies versus doing home studies, perhaps over two to three days. Um, are you seeing your sleep labs um, do any of that? Um, and I can certainly share what we've heard from a few centers as well. Um, Dr. Padim, you wanna do that one first? Yeah, well, so the question was whether in home, uh, in a home studies, you know, replacing the current overnight stays in the hotel or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, I can't, um, would you, I cannot say whether that has been changing. I know that we have multiple locations where we do overnight stays in a, in a hospitalized setting, but I cannot speak to in-home tests and as to how, how good they perform. I mean, actually, question back to you, Robin. Do you think that um, they would provide you 
sufficient information to make a call about the predominant component of sleep apnea? Yeah, so, so we did it in the trial. Um, we, we used home studies inside cardiology clinics as a screening, more of a screening methodology. And then patients with a high percentage of central then had an in-lab sleep study. And we are, you know, our responses were very good. Um, the, the problem has come right now with COVID-19 and most of the sleep labs completely shut down um, with COVID-19. But the ATS actually just came out um, Sunday. It's kind of a weird day for a guideline drop, but um, with, with guidelines that these patients with cardiovascular diseases should be prioritized to do in-lab studies because they have a high risk of central as well as high risk for, um, for things like insomnia and restless leg. So, so ideally, you know, the, the sort of the, the academic physician side of me says it's nice to have an in-lab study, um, but if you have a really high risk patient population, you can definitely see central sleep apnea in some home studies, not all home studies. So working with, um, and I, it does appear I have a mix here tonight uh, of both sleep, you know, sleep clinicians as well as heart failure as cardiac uh, physicians um, to, to build that partnership so that you build that kind of right collaboration for your center. Um, but we are seeing some movement towards um, multi-night um, class, what's called a class three homes device that can distinguish between obstructive or central um, for some high-risk patients, especially in the time that the sleep lab's completely closed. All right, I think I got, oh, I, I think I got behind here. Jody. I, I missed a few. Do you wanna bring up the, go ahead please, Jody. Sorry, okay. I was um, Yes, so um, there's a few, um, how about, have there been any studies that allow CPAP BiPAP treatment alongside of phrenic nerve stimulation? Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, Ramesh talked about the fact that he had had a few patients um, with that. There's a case study that's been reported now with that combination therapy. Um, but we've only seen CPAP used, so, um, so I think that one's pretty good. Yep. Somebody mentioned the Trilogy machine. Right, Trilogy machine, can you comment on this? I do not really understand what it is and what it does. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, pass along because I too uh, am not very familiar with the trilogy machine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I stay quiet too on that one. <laughs> All right. So let's skip on that. Is that one. a movie? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so uh, this is a good question. So we, you know, we talk about central sleep apnea, but do you want to talk about the relationship? with Shane Stokes breathing and whether there were patients included um, in the, the study with Shane Stokes breathing. Yeah, I'll start with that. And I'll actually be interested to see if Dr. Fadim uh, has a similar differing opinion because that was a lot of the debate that uh, came out after survey Jeff uh, was that, you know, maybe some of these disrupted sleeping patterns are actually Shane Stokes and maybe this is a somewhat uh, adaptive and uh, if, if not protective response in heart failure patients. I, I think if you look at true chain stokes and you look at patients with severe apnea, uh, as mentioned, you know, AHIs that were in the 40s, uh, the, this isn't simple chain stokes. I think this is an exaggerated, if not overdriven response. But maybe more importantly to understand is not necessarily the underlying chain stokes, but when you're treating apnea or disrupted breathing, how you treat it may actually play a little bit of a role too. And if you start with the idea that chain stokes is related to uh, some of the heart failure and changes in filling pressures uh, within the ventricles and then um, also has some secondary effects on wall tension um, and myocardial ischemia, uh, treating with positive pressure uh, may actually be detrimental because of changes in venous return back to the heart. So, uh, you know, the same problems that we have with some of our cardiac patients who go for uh, 
laparoscopic surgeries, you don't want to impede venous return in the RV. Uh, the RV, and for those that are on the advanced heart failure side, we learn it's just very finicky and just very, you know, gets very upset at times. Uh, and so if you're changing venous return, if you're changing filling pressures uh, and then driving uh, in, in that sense, you can cause ventricular arrhythmias or at least theoretically can cause worsening ventricular arrhythmias, uh, which may have been the drive towards the increase in cardiovascular death and serve. Um, you know, I think more study needs to be done, but I think what we see with phrenic nerve stimulation, I mentioned this idea that if you stimulate the phrenic nerve, stimulate the diaphragm, you create a relative negative intrathoracic pressure, which then stimulates or actually relaxes the cardiac cycle in a more natural way. I'm increasing venous return for that period of time. I'm not impeding output, uh, after load and output, and that may actually be the way our body responds to chain stokes. You take that big breath in uh, after a chain stoke period that kind of is a, is a reset uh, and filling pressures without changes in wall tension or rel uh, relatively less change in wall tension. Um, so I, that, that's the way I've always viewed it from uh, other smart people who have discussed that pattern. But uh, Dr. Padim, how do you approach that? Yeah, so excellent point. Uh, you know, if you look at survey chap and look at where, which are the patients that died. Those were the patients with an LVF less than 25 and sort of more evidence of uh, advanced disease congestion. And more recently, a paper from the PISA group in Italy, published in Jack two months ago, actually reaffirmed that they had a study with, I believe, greater than a thousand patients with central sleep apnea that, um, that underwent tilt table testing. And essentially what they found is that, first of all, presence of chain stokes uh, in a supine position, when you lie on your back, is bad and associated with bad outcomes. It's associated with more congestion. But when you have patients that also continue having central uh, chain stokes breathing with upright position, because you do not have to be asleep to have chain stokes breathing. This is not something you only have with your eyes closed and while asleep. You can have it during the uh, during upright uh, hours in the day, and that is a particularly bad sign because that is associated with even worse uh, advanced systolic heart failure in that study. So worse pro BNPs, uh, they had worse exam findings, and they had significantly worse clinical outcomes. So in summary, presence of chain stokes is probably an indication of more advanced disease, more likely uh, restricted to patients with advanced systolic heart failure. <clears throat> and I think come, to come to, to the point whether, you know, whether phrenic nerve stimulation is contraindicated in that, you know, I, I cannot say that because it acts very differently as Dr. Amani pointed out. Physiologically, it attempts to simulate the breathing patterns and avoid positive pressure ventilation. And it's my understanding that the studies that I just presented you, the pooled analysis did not exclude presence of chain stokes breathing. Yeah, that is correct. And in fact, we have a poster that I think is is at the APSS meeting that will actually present the cohort, uh, comparing the cohort with and without uh, Shane Stokes respiration. So that's great. All right. Um, so with that, I, I do see one question on deep brain stimulation. And just to, to answer that question, um, as far as I know, there's no work going on in deep brain stimulation and CSA um, because just of the location that you need to probably get to in the brain. Um, but, but if anyone has heard something different, I, I'd be interested to hear. So with that all, Jody. Yeah, um, thank you all for joining and for the questions. And thank you very much, for Dr. Imani, Dr. Fudim, for your wonderful presentations. and engaging presentations. Um, we really appreciate it. We had a good turnout and uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thanks all.